Hello, everyone. Welcome to part one of our Data Byte Spring series titled Conversations on the Datafied State. This is our first ever three part series, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Rigoberto Lara Guzman. You can call me Rigo. I use the he pronouns, and I am the senior producer here at DNS. Thrilled to kick off this discussion alongside our three amazing speakers for today. But before that, uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Join me in reciting our digital land acknowledgement. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and forests in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenapehoking, the ancestral land of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different kind of network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. Our host today for this discussion is Director of Research at DNS, Jenna Burrell, and I will pass it now to Jenna to take it from here and introduce our guest. Thank you so much, Rigo. Um, hello, I am Jenna Burrell, as mentioned, the Director of Research here at Data and Society. Um, we also have CJ, our event producer, behind the scenes here, thanks to the team for helping pull this together. Yeah, so we're here today to talk about the datafied state. As governments procure, develop, implement, and mandate the use of digital and computational systems, the state becomes ever more datafied. And as governments specifically procure digital tech from the private sector, the boundaries between private and public power are increasingly blurred. Um, we are launching kind of our first public event on our emerging research agenda that on the datafied state which explores the growing impact of digital tech and data systems across civic life and looks at the benefits and risks they pose to the public. We're hosting a series of conversations, including researchers, technology designers, lawyers, activists, policy experts, and public administrators to develop this agenda across three lines of inquiry. The first we're talking about today uh, is focused on algorithms and this idea of the public interest. The second, which is coming up, looks at automation and welfare programs, social welfare. And the third looks at surveillance and resistance. Um, through these conversations, we're trying to build a shared understanding and an empirical grounding to guide the governance and use of these technologies toward equity and in the public interest. So I'm hoping today we start with a, a somewhat hopeful perspective um, we're thinking about the possibilities of tech built in the public interest. Uh, as governments seek to solve problems, they prioritize values uh, beyond market fit and return on investment. Their, their incentives are different from those of the private sector. We are typically thinking about the government as regulators of tech, but this conversation is meant to shift us to look instead at the ways that governments use and deploy tech. And when they do so, there's an in-house opportunity to model responsible, accountable, and accessible tech. Furthermore, for researchers, there's, there's something uh, on, on the table available to us as well, because governments often have these transparency requirements, requirements, which means we have a better glimpse into the workings of a datafied state than perhaps we do into what's going on in the private sector. So as a starting point for this conversation, uh, we're going to just st start with some foundational conversation about the public interest. What do we mean by the public interest? And what is public interest technology? Who's a public interest technologist? Is government where we should expect the public interest to be upheld? 
there are two experts joining me today who have extensive and long-standing experience in this area. Uh, the first is Professor Ann Washington, who's an assistant professor of data policy at NYU and director of the Digital Interests Lab at NYU. The second is Professor Deirdre Mulligan, who's a professor in the School of Information at UC Berkeley. She's the faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, and she's a co-organizer of the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group. I was looking across our respective credentials and experiences, and I realized we, between the three of us, we've got sociology degrees, art history, architecture, law, so, uh, I said sociology, computer science, um, we really run the, the gamut of kind of forms of training. And then we've also, between the three of us, we're, we're, we've all worked as professors, but also in think tanks and nonprofits and in government. So I'm really excited to see how our conversation goes. I'm going to principally be paying, playing the role of guiding that conversation and teeing up questions. Um, and so I'm going to start with my first question. I'm going to ask this question to Anne. If, can you tell us a little bit of the history of the concept of the public interest, and then tell us about yourself. Like, how does your career intersect with this concept? Thank you for that invitation and introduction, Jenna. Um, so, my idea of the public interest orients around what uh, Justice uh, Louis Brandeis said, and uh, he gave a talk to the Harvard Ethical Society of all places in 1905. And the gist of that talk was he noticed that the best legal minds of his generation were only working for the wealthy. In an adversarial court system, you have to have two sides of the case. So how can a case be fairly argued if all the talent is only on one side? Um, and that left no one to represent the public interest. So he started to advocate for a balance on the seesaw that the people who have great talent and interest in the law should be represented on both sides, representing the public interest of the many against the private interest of the few. And that is my orientation to what public interest technology could be. Right now, we have a lot of smart people working in the Valley and working in a lot of private uh, technology companies, but there are other opportunities and we need technology everywhere in society. So it's important to have that kind of talent um, expanded in other forms. The other thing I think is important when we think about uh, public interest technology for me is that it builds a bigger tent. So we are thinking of all the things that it encompasses as opposed to just technology artifacts. I have a long and varied career that got me to this point, but when I first heard people starting to talk about public interest technology, I knew it really uh, resonated with what I had seen and what my experiences were, which, you know, from starting off working at, at Apple and Silicon Valley, you know, and then going through corporate, um, I ended up deciding to try to save my country by working for the government and doing technology there. And I actually found it intellectually challenging because in consumer and private interest uh, workplaces, you're focused on a really specific target audience. In fact, you're making that audience and then you're serving that audience. When you're working with the public, you don't have that luxury. You have to serve everyone. You have to figure out how to do the hard work. And that is what I thought was really interesting about this one little corner. And also that it was interdisciplinary. It was really involving a lot of people. Deirdre, same um, question. How did you find yourself in this space? What's your, your history um, that brings you to this, this domain of public interest technology? Yeah, um, thank you both for having me and for having me with Anne, which I'm really delighted about, um, and for you know, opening the data bytes with this question about you know, what is this emerging field of public interest technology? Um, so I have a very kind of deeply situated perspective, right? Um, for me, I am a lawyer, my training is in law, and I benefited from the programs that were created to help lawyers become public interest lawyers. I was not the first, but among the first uh, uh, public interest law scholars at Georgetown. And I went there intentionally because I wanted to come out as somebody who was equipped 
particularly to do legislative policy. Um, I had uh, been a legal assistant, as many people are before they go to law school, and I'd also done a fair amount of advocacy and community organizing and had different perspectives on how social change happens. And I was less interested in doing kind of the one-on-one -on -one client representation work and much more interested in making legislative changes and making kind of broad sweeping policy changes that could reform society, I hoped, um, in a more kind of systematic way. Um, sometimes litigation can feel like a whack-a-mole endeavor. And the public interest law movement, right, is like explicitly at its origin, a liberal movement emerging in the 60s and the 70s, which was centered initially about around kind of providing counsel to relatively powerless, minoritized, marginalized individuals and groups. And you can think of that Brandeis orientation, but also vindicating the interests of diffuse majorities, right, against the kind of more mercurial and individualistic, often corporate interests. Um, and also, I think for me, as somebody who during law school worked at the American Civil Liberties Union, and then went on to spend some time at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and help start the Center for Democracy and Technology, interested in championing shared public values, right? Um, that societies aspire and commit to, right? You can think about our um, Bill of Rights and you can think about human rights, commitments to civil liberties and, um, across the world, but in reality require kind of constant affirmation and defense, right? That they're popular in kind of that thin way, but when the rubber hits the road, they often become things that are easy to fall by the wayside. And so when we think about you know, public interest technology as a field, for me, it's very much situated in that same sort of public interest orientation that encompasses service, it encompasses policy change, and it accompanies um, really it, it captures an orientation towards justice, right? For me, the, the public interest. Um, and when we think about, um, you know, like as a lawyer, it's very clear it's a profession, right? And you get trained, but when you go out in the world, if you actually wanna be a public interest lawyer, you typically find yourself in an organization that isn't just, there are public interest law firms that are kind of very much, but they tend to be litigation oriented, but a lot of the social change organizations that one finds oneself in, um, yes, lawyers are an essential component, but there are community organizers and there are strategists and there are communications experts and there are different kinds of lawyers. There are litigators, there are legislative policy folks, there are folks that um, focus explicitly on regulatory activity. And as I was um, you know, an up and coming lawyer, uh, many of the kind of deeply technical issues that we were invo involved in things, you know, debates about whether or not crypto backdoors were good for the public interest, right? And you can think about the public interest being a very contested topic all the time. It became really apparent that we needed a new kind of professional in the mix, right? We needed people with certain kinds of technical competencies because we needed to be able to think about that. And if we think about the law as a tool for social change, if we think, you know, there was a, one of the freedom rides through Oakland the other day and people came out and organized and kind of drove them out of town, right? Organizing as a tool for social change. Technology wasn't just something to regulate. It, it was also something that could be used to protect rights and values that we care about on behalf of the public. So for me, that's kind of my orientation towards what is in the public interest and why technology has to be part of that story. So public interest law predates this kind of contemporary conversation about public interest technology. Um, and it has this real, it's really rooted in law schools and professional training for lawyers. So I, what I want to ask next, and either one of you could address this question, is what happens when we add the word technology? I mean, Deirdre, you've sort of started to, to point to that. What is public interest technology? And who is a public interest technologist? What does it mean to add that word into the conversation? I'll just jump in here. I... 
For me, I think it's important that technologist implies a variety of expertise. It does not necessarily mean a computer science degree. Um, it does not necessarily mean expertise in STEM. A lot of the expertise in current systems are from the users. It's, uh, as a sociologist, you might say it's lay expertise. Um, I think it's important to note, although my uh, undergraduate degree is in computer science, what I studied for my doctorate was on how companies manage and work with their technology systems. And that was a whole different perspective. I see a lot of technology from a management perspective, like what is going on in the organization that creates the dynamic that creates this technology. Um, and although public interest lawyers have a very clear professionalization process, I wouldn't call myself a public interest lawyer if I hadn't gone to law school to do drugs. I'm sure we'll jump in here. Um, public interest tech doesn't, and it shouldn't, because we need all forms of expertise. People who really know how to code might not be as aware of some of the dynamics of how it happens out in the world. Um, and as I said earlier, public interest tech to me is about service in the way that Deidre was just talking about public interest law. It's about service to everyone. Technology is a necessary um, infrastructure. And the way I always describe it is that Commercial, uh, commercial technology is for the 80%. It's for the easy pieces. It's for the people just happen to be around, the people with the most money, the people you see. And uh, public interest tech is for the 100%. It's for the freaks, it's for the geeks, it's for the outliers. It's for those of us at the edge of the chart who still need technology services. And that's why this is so important. Otherwise, we're gonna have a, a, a complete infrastructure, financial, civic, social infrastructure that by definition leaves out huge groups of people. And that's why I think public interest technology is so important. Um, so when I think about the public interest technology field, and I wanna distinguish that from public interest technologist, um, it to me refers, and I think this is a pretty shared, you know, I, I helped craft some of the kind of definitional documents that have been used to orient this field as it kind of seeks to grow and stabilize across kind of educational communities and philanthropy, um, but refers to kind of the application of technology expertise broadly construed, right, as Anne was describing it, um, to advance the public interest, generate public benefits, promote the public good, promote social justice. Um, I think that definition underscores some very important points or one that Anne um, started to outline is that technology is expertise is broader than engineering and computer science, right? It's about a set of capabilities to create, apply, use, regulate, right? Um, technology uh, that draws on understandings of kind of its contextual application is attentive to ethical, legal, political, and social dimensions. And I think this kind of mixed body of knowledge that enables the development and application of technologies and the resistance to them, right, to align with social and political possibilities, right, is kind of the important components. And many of the people who I view as like leading public and members of the public interest technology field, they don't identify primarily as technologists, right? That, but they do have technical expertise. It could be um, because they are a product of a particular disciplinary training, but some of them have gotten it on the job, right? That. Um, you know, early on in my legal career, I spent an enormous amount of time at the World Wide Web Consortium and the Internet Engineering Task Force working on technical standards, right? And I, my undergraduate degrees are in architecture, art history, and studio art, right? Uh, architecture, I guess, kind of STEM field, but, uh, you know, like, it, it, and, and I would never hold myself out as like a deeply technical person, but I am certainly somebody who's kind of in that broadly defined field of public interest technology because thinking about the possibilities and the limitations of technology has been part of my practice since kind of early on. 
Um, and the second, you know, which we kind of opened with is this, like, what is at the center? What's the core? is this kind of centering of work around public interest. But public interest can be served in different ways, right? And Anne was talking very much about like public service delivery, right? And this idea that we have to serve the whole population. We can't choose our audience in some narrow way that's aligned with a particular profit motive that we need to be designing for everyone and to make sure that access is equitable and service delivery is equitable. But it also encompasses shaping public priorities, shaping public policy. It involves, you know, not just kind of building technology, but kind of advocating for limitation constraints, particular choices about its use by government, by the pub private sector. And I think that the public interest technology field encompasses people who are trying to orient technology towards a better public version of life, whether they are in the public or private sector or whether they're working in government or in an advocacy organization. So there's an orientation rather than like a very ex a particular role. I think you can practice public interest technology in lots of different ways. The same way as, you know, my brother is a public defender, right? He's definitely a public interest lawyer. And I, you know, work at the Center for Democracy and Technology and then was the first director of the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at Berkeley, which was the first legal clinic to train up and coming lawyers to think about the public interest in relationship to technology. And we do very different work, my brother and I, yet we're both part of that public interest law field. Um, I think this idea is super interesting and maybe we can develop it a little further about designing for everybody. Um, I know in a previous conversation, we talked a little bit about that in terms of percentages. And um, I mean, it seems like a tall order. How do you, how do you design, how can you call for a design that everyone can use? Um, further thoughts about that. Is that a reasonable request? Can it happen? Does it happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, of course, the famous example, right, is in the built world are curb cuts that were created so that way people who use wheelchairs could get up and down through the city streets. And that innovation helped everyone, right? So we were talking about things that can be designed that actually support um, a wide group of people in terms of what happens, my expertise is in government data and how people use it and shape it. And I mean, the clearest best example we just had, which was the COVID home test delivery. This was not uh, healthcare.gov. It was super easy. There was a web form, there was an address, no verification, no weird something, no regulatory kind of, no capture from anyone, um, no third party data grab you plop in your address and you get a test kit and it managed expectations so that they won't be available for X number of weeks. Super clear, super clear. Um, the, a lot of the COVID technology, all the pandemic technology was just all vaporware, um, most of it. It was some big splashy web page that really wouldn't help uh, people who needed a test, needed a vaccine, um, it was just technology for technology's sake. So I think we need to balance out when we can build something that serves the need. And by the way, the simple web form also had a phone number. Oh, and by the way, the simple web form also had a place where someone could help you fill out that form in person, state by state. So you start to see that technology will provide efficiency like I said, for a large number, but then you also have to think about how you're gonna handle the edge cases. Yeah, I, that, that language, I think you hear a lot in tech around edge cases and corner cases and how difficult they are. And, you know, for a private sector um, uh, project, it's often like, well, we can't get to those or it's not, it's not gonna be profitable. And that is not an excuse you can make if you're really designing for the public, for the entire public, which is really interesting to think about. Um, so accessibility is certainly one of those dimensions of, of serving the public interest, serving the public through tech. Um, Jirda, do you have other examples that we can discuss around tech and the public interest? 
Um, sure. Uh, there's a, for me, it feels like kind of a perennial story around voting technology. Um, when uh, the Help America Vote Act, which came about after the, you know, hanging chads of the Bush v. Gore debacle election, um, uh, infused cash into the voting sector, um, the election sector, providing uh, money for states and actually counties to buy new voting technology to upgrade, modernize, you know, all the language we like to hear um, with, you know, new technology. However, uh, the government didn't articulate standards that were uh, accessibility standards, security, privacy, right? Like there's a whole host of expectations that we have that when voting was conducted in the particular material of, you know, paper and you would write on it and it was a fixed artifact that didn't undergo any additional processing and then people counted it. And if you needed a recount, you could go back. So you audited the counting process. And because so many of the properties that were important were kind of bound up in the material properties, they were not well articulated, right? And so um, companies built systems that were just like not fit for purpose, right? And my, um, you know, the, the most profound example, right, is touch the original touchscreen voting systems that would render a ballot on the fly and you would, you know, poke what you wanted to and then it would say, hey, is this how you want to vote? And you'd say yes. And what it would do on the back end is just increment the votes, right? So it wasn't even, right, even like capturing a ballot image if the whole thing is being processed in the same system still creates some real trust gaps and accountability problems, but it wasn't even doing that, right? So if you think about, well, we need to audit the election, we wanna, what we really audit is we audit the counting process, right? Like how the ballots were evaluated and the electronic systems had collapsed casting and counting in a way that made an audit, you know, impossible, right? And so then we had this whole process where we got these voter verified paper trails, right? And some of the reasons that touchscreen voting were attractive um, was for accessibility issues, right? That they have ports and you can listen. And, and so, you know, thinking about, there was a lot of thinking that needed to be done to clarify how to serve the public and how to make sure that these new systems, right, protected the secret ballot, maintained security, um, supported accessibility, and most importantly, supported, it, supported a real meaningful audit. Because the real task, right, the medal of an election is whether or not the loser actually believes that they lost and their constituents believe that they lost. And as you know, we have a real like kind of crisis today about people kind of destabilizing trust in the outputs of our election systems, even though, right, most of those systems have been fixed, right? And so we have right now, I believe, really trustworthy, right, that as a technical matter, those systems are robust and systems that I think should be trusted because the public can see the counting process, they can see the recounts, right? There's lots of both adversarial participation, Republicans, Democrats, independents can all watch the recounts, right? But, but even in that context, there's still, right, ongoing concerns about the machinery of democracy, right? And what I wanna say is like attention to the ways in which um, kind of latent properties that are in the materials that we use to perform a particular civic function need to be like really clearly articulated and expressed if we want to carry them forward into new systems. And that is one of the reasons that I think technical expertise is so important 
but as is domain expertise, right? There were plenty of technologists at those voting companies, but there weren't enough election specialists. There weren't enough people who think about kind of the, the politics of elections and like the, the trust, not in a narrow technical definition, although the initial systems were incredibly insecure, but trust as a human social process, right? And what's required to maintain it. I love what everything you just said, Deidre. And I think this is this is the, the thing that's so hard. Data science classes and courses are just so packed of trying to get you to learn all the latest technology. There's, there's little space for anything else. The course I teach is on ethical data science. And in fact, I'm finishing up a book that's um, based on that class. And what I'm trying to do is to show data scientists where they can do better. And like, and the, my, my idea here is that to import these important, to match these important social science concepts within the context of specific steps while you're doing the data science. So it's not something that happens after, it's not like this big thing you have to do before, but that it's integrated. And I feel like that is the integration we're missing, which is why we end up with um, these, these software things that just don't work. Um, Jenna, did you wanna follow up? I wanted to go back to this idea of the great imbalance, um, because I think we are living in a period of great imbalance right now, just in terms of the power of big tech companies to sort of influence government, to sell products to government, to do lobbying. Um, and if public interest technology as a field is about um, balance, balancing the scale, once again, trying to balance the scale, how do we do that? I mean, I think you've both talked about training. Um, what was it kind of institutionally and infrastructurally that uh, made it possible for electronic voting machines to be critiqued and improved and made trustworthy? Um, what do we need to build? Yeah, so um, this, I, I think there's a really like, I'm gonna answer your question, but I wanna start a little bit broader. Right? I think that there is an appetite right now, right, for Anne's course and for Anne's book. And for you know, the work, Jenna, that you were doing at Berkeley, which you're continuing at Data and Society, and the sort of classes that I teach both to our masters and PhD students and our undergrads, right? Um, and I think, right, if we go back to the emergence of the public interest law movement, there was not just kind of a recognition of the need to balance the scales, right? There was also this really strong critique of the legal profession, right? This idea that like lawyers' conceptions of professionalism was enough to be a good lawyer or to do good work, right? In a kind of like public interest oriented way, you know, making sure that both sides had good representation was like the end of the day, right? And I think right now, the reason that there is an appetite for Anne's class or for, you know, this conversation that we're having today in um, uh, the academy in kind of STEM fields, particularly data science, computer science, engineering, but I think even much more broadly, as well as in the tech sector itself, um, is that I think that we're seeing kind of a crisis in those professions, right? They're like, oh, being a good engineer doesn't kind of absolve me of the fact that the stuff I produce does real damage in the world, right? That I don't want to be a hired gun. I actually want to think about the outcomes that my work produces in the world. And I want to align them with some vision of justice or some vision of the good life. And it's interesting to me, I think if we look, you know, if you go back, some of you may be familiar with the Office of Technology Assessment, which was, you know, it was uh, uh, agency that gave advice to Congress about technology policy. It was incredibly important. It was one of the casualties of the Gingrich contract on America. Um, and it was an acknowledgement even back then, right in the 80s, I believe, um, it was formed that, you know, technology was going to really shape all aspects of society and that we needed to be having real thoughtful kind of conversations about the policy implications and how to align it with our political and social goals. 
Um, and I think you then see, right, organizations, I've mentioned the Center for Democracy and Technology, but also the Electronic Frontier Foundation, right, working closely with different subfields in computer science and engineering, and eventually staffing up and hiring technologists. We have the emergence of organizations like Code for America, which really are in that like public service, you know, that I, I don't know that I would equate them with like um, legal services, right? But there's a kind of similar, we need to make sure that governments have access to a strong technical workforce. And then we have federal agencies like the Federal Trade Commission hiring technologists because they understand how important it is. And there are technologists who are like, oh yeah, I want to do kind of good public oriented work. I don't just want to work for profit. And I think there's a real shift there. And then of course we get, as you know, Anne mentioned healthcare.gov, you know, we get this immense crisis moment where there's this realization that we haven't designed technology in a way that kind of meets the needs of the hundred percent. And we get out of that, right, the creation of the US Digital Services and 18F and kind of a greater entrenchment of not, you know, the IT staff, but technical people. And again, broadly defined who are focused on the relationship between public values and public needs. Um, and the design and use and deployment of technology. And then I think finally we get these crisis, you know, scandals, Cambridge Analytica. Um, Jenna, you may remember Google's director of research at the time, Peter Norvig, coming to give a keynote at one of the iSchool commencements. And he was kind of lamenting the fact that like the greatest minds of the generation were like focused on how to get people to click on advertisements. And like, wasn't that I think a waste of human potential, right? And right, and this, and I. So I think we see like there's this crisis, and and particularly as we've seen big data, machine learning, AI. Yes, sure, there's efforts to use it for good, but there's an enormous number of well documented casualties, right? Whether they were intentional bad uses or just thoughtless, careless, not enough attention to the situated realities and the um, practical needs of both the users and the populations to be served that I think have led to this crisis in some of the STEM fields that create a desire to be a public-minded technologist, to have an education that allows you to practice in a way whether it's in the public, private, or you know, social sector, in a way that supports human rights, civil liberties, and I don't think those are things that the government delivers in and on its own, right? I mean, all you need yeah. to do is mention Twitter and Elon Musk right now, and and we know, right, the importance of that platform for our public values. And we know that the government doesn't have all that much to say, or they have a lot to say, but how much they can do versus but, well, what other forces we might need to bring. Yeah, I, don't think that, I don't think the government has to say something in this case. And I, I think the big point is that this is a new profession, right? Like schools only recently have computer science departments, much less data science departments, and there aren't professional ethics. And I, I think, you know, and then also what do what does it mean to have ethics for technology, right? For lawyers, you have for if you're a doctor, it's like don't kill someone. If you're a lawyer, you know, represent somebody's interest. But at, for data science, like for computer science, what does that mean? I also think it's important that lawyers, if we're just gonna keep with this comparison, like they can do pro bono work, right? Like you can go off and you can work at a big firm and you can also uh, take really important cases. Uh, Christopher Wolf is one example of that, who, and you get still your professional status because you can argue to the Supreme Court or something like that. And you get a lot of outside validation. I really wish that the tech industry could start thinking like this and have it verified by somebody else. I know that you know you don't you're not going to take a bono case that has to do with the people who litigate at your firm, right? Like there's this distance. So could people and a lot of engineers have these side projects, their ten percent projects for whatever they do at the firm? Yes, it does in uh, in engineering innovation. 
but wouldn't it be great if it served the public interest instead? And how could we figure out, like have a proper clinic, but a technology clinic, like to really help people. I think that, that we're struggling with it as a profession of knowing what it means. We're struggling with, well, if somebody gives me this data set, can I use it? Is it ethical for me to use this data set? Those are questions my students bring to me all the time and they're tough. They're really tough. You want the professional accolades for doing something with a new data set that will get you tenure or a job or a degree. But what about the people represented in those data sets? How do we engage with that? And if you don't do it, somebody else besides you might. So how do we start to have these conversations? I think that is what the field of public interest technology is starting to grapple with. Another example came to mind for me. So I know, you know, people speaking of people in tech and kind of their side side involvements or side projects. For example, there's the Tech Equity Collaborative. Um, Catherine Bracy is on Data and Society's board of directors, um, and uh, and she's their their co-founder. Um, they involve tech people from tech to speak on issues around equity. Um, and for example, to show up at city council meetings and to speak as experts on techno the technologies that might be debated, for example, smart cities like surveillance technologies to speak um, from the perspective of the community rather than from the perspective of the vendor who's trying to sell some smart city, smart city product and bringing all of that um, expertise and kind of credibility as technologist into that conversation to represent another perspective on it. Um, so there's one more example to throw into the mix. Um, I am going to start asking some questions now from the pool that we've been collecting. Um, one question is, and I think we've kind of been sliding around this is, you know, when we're talking about um, public interest technology, uh, is that just civic technology? Is that, is civic tech part of it? I, I think civic tech is one corner of it. And by civic tech, that is the idea that they're technologies that help the government run and do things or that are interrelated. A lot of my work is on government open data. So a lot of civic tech is built on government open data. Sometimes it's about the vendors, it brings it in. This is the world of hackathons. I think it starts to have a broader understanding and definition of what technology could mean in the public interest. I don't think it's limited to civic tech. Yeah, I um, I would fully agree with Anne that civic tech is certainly part of it. And I, I would also kind of define civic tech um, maybe more broadly, right? It's not just about service provision using technology. It's also about governments having the competency to evaluate and assess the extent to which the use of technology is appropriate to shape it, constrain it, target it in a way that kind of meets the goals and kind of holds the rest of the social cloth, the public commitments that governments make to citizens whole. And so even if we're talking about civic tech, it's not just about the people who are kind of like doing the deployment activities and give some really concrete examples, right? If you look at Oakland, for example, right, we have um, a surveillance ordinance. And when we're going to use surveillance technology, it has to go through um, the Oakland Privacy Commission, which looks at it and does an assessment the police department have to do a kind of evaluation. And that is not, it, it's to make sure that kind of the procurement, the onboarding of the technology, while it might be important for policing or it might be important for parking enforcement, right? Doesn't as a kind of side effect, diminish citizen privacy, create new security risks or, leave all of the important data for city planning locked up in some private vendors vaults right and so there's like there's both the provisioning of the service but there's also a lot of civic tech activity that is about these kind of policy considerations and contracts and um, and kind of stewardship of citizens information and citizens rights 
I'm just going to jump in here and say that I feel like there's um, some people, some private sector companies say that they're building civic tech or building public interest tech when it just means it's not for a defined population, meaning that it could be open to anyone. So like the Verily COVID testing scheme was supposedly in the public. I mean, they might've said it was for good or whatever, but that's an example of technology that's not in the public interest because it was only available to people with phones, with QR codes who had traveled by airplane, like, you know, left out people who were on public transportation, left out people without the latest technology. So sometimes we have to start to move in between these uh, definitions. And for me, all of this just used to be digital government, but that was back when I was a young lady. Yeah. Anyhow, that, next. That is, um, I mean, that was, you. I don't know if you were reading the questions, Anne, but that was, so one of the questions is what isn't public interest tech? And I'm gonna read this this bit from, this is a question from Alex Howard. In the world of good governance, OpenGov Inc. exists, a venture-backed software company that hosts public sector financial data, but it's hardly alone in the corporate world, which greenwashes and astroturfs. So when is public interest tech not? When is it, uh, when is it a facade? When is it a sort of deceptive um, strategy used by companies? thing to know is that the majority of open data is used for businesses. It is not used. There's not the, don't imagine some citizen coding into the night to find out what their public sector people are doing. Um, it, it is really used as part of the business ecosystem and bad government data is a business opportunity because somebody can add all the extra text and stuff and sell it. And uh, it's a very good markup price. So that's the other side of open data and open government. This question about like, what is the public interest? Um, I, I would say, right, the public interest is difficult to define. It's constantly contested, um, but it is understood to reflect kind of an emphasis on the welfare of society in general, rather than the welfare of a particular individual group or company. Um, and I think that that does distinguish what we mean by kind of the public interest from other, other ways in which your expertise might be put to use. And government is always seen as playing a, a you know, key role in advancing social objectives. Um, but, you know, sometimes the, the biggest threat to the public interest and if we see the public interest as encompass, encompassing the kind of pre-commitments we've made, right? Human rights, our bill of rights, right? That we've made commitments to these things because we think they're important for free and open societies, for democratic societies. Sometimes the government is the key threat to those rights and interests. And the folks who are advocating to protect them may therefore be outside government. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, the relationship between technology and the public interest, you know, clearly there's plenty of ways in which technology can be deployed on behalf of public policy priorities, right, to help advance the public interest. I think that the definition of public interest creates space for both kind of the, the recognition and I think like the imperative to really critically assess the risks and benefits and at times to refuse technology, which I think is another question that was coming up. Um, you know, it, it is a framework that says all uses of technology are not civic, are not public, are not you know, public interest oriented, and that we need to be open to the idea that um, technology is being brought into the public, the public sector in a way that's gonna undermine the public interest because it's serving a private profit motive. That could also be a government profit motive. Um, some of the examples in my book look at how governments have tried to save money and then end up creating systems that have so much litigation that they lose it. So a public interest is different than a private interest, just a few people, a financial interest. So you can still be in government and be more interested in the financial interest than the public interest and create like the Australian robo debt system is a classic example. What happened in Michigan, what happened in the Netherlands, like this is 
uh, repeated over and over again. Um, so you have private interest, you have financial interests, and all of these different interests start to compete. And that's when you can start to try to figure out and pull us apart. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of revenue generation through policing in, for example, in Ferguson and all the things that came out about that. Um, there's a question which I think relates to this. Uh, is there a trade-off between pushing for better civic technology and better policy? And I always like an opportunity to kind of tee up the conversation about the solution space. Is it, if we're solving problems, do we, even if we're, we kind of identify as public interest technologists, do we solve problems by building better tech or by uh, different institutional designs or designing new process or designing impact assessments or passing legislation? Um, this question's from, Re yes. I, I've added on, but the question from Rebecca Ackerman is about the trade-off between better civic tech and better policy. And she says she worries that we run the risk of creating turbo tax like situations in other parts of government. User-friendly civic tech makes things palatable to enough people that we can ignore the larger policy fixes needed. Yeah, uh, so the example of TurboTax, right, is that it automated this one regulatory thing that individuals needed to interact with the government. Um, however, one company sort of owns that idea, and even though parts of it are supposed to be free, um, a lot of people don't get to the free part. So that's sort of the problem there. Uh, I, I think that we need all of it, right? You can't just have the technology without also the policy on top of it. You can't do it without the institutions. I think the stories that I've been looking at in depth, like what happened in Australia, is that it, it was everything. It wasn't just the policy looked good on paper. They made one particular choice in building their model that kind of destroyed all of the things that Deidre was talking about, about these important values. That was just a data science, small little choice and it blew everything else away. So you have to have all of these things working in concert. Um, I would say that while we need them all working in concert, we right now need to pay more attention to the policy side. Um, and I think one of the reasons defining the public interest technology field as encompassing people in addition to technically trained people is because you know many of the systems fail because they were like not fit for the problem they were being used to solve right like there there was no amount of tinkering around at the edges that would have made that technology appropriate for this particular use and the domain experts, the social scientists who understand how things happen in domains that study them, um, the, you know, the actual practitioners on the ground have that knowledge that can help us understand whether or not a technology, um, a technological fix or solution is going to be kind of the, the right sort of choice. And I, you know, I think that there are times when what we are concerned about is tinkering around redesigning the technical system. But I think that's the second question, right? The first question is like, is this particular innovation, which might be really hard to resist because there's somebody trying really hard to sell it to you, um, really the best way to serve the public's interest? And I think that if technologists are leading that conversation on their own, we don't get enough reflection on the kind of limitations and we end up with too much techno solutionism. So I think that we need those like broader tent conversations first, because there are real reasons um, to resist some technologies. It's not just about like the implementation details. Deidre, that's a really good point. And I'd like to pile on by saying I forgot, I left out political purpose um, because that's a lot of what I am seeing right now as I look at government tech, how the tech is serving certain political choices. So in that case in Australia, it's not just that they didn't think of this or that the technology, maybe the technologist pushed it on it, but it served a political purpose. And so that conversation, if, if you just have technologists and politicians in the room, we're in trouble. Like we need some other people 
in who are able to have conversations. And like you said, like we were talking about the seesaw, really balance the public interest. That could be um, uh, either people who just have that perspective or, or other administrative people. And just to kind of as final remarks, there are a few big takeaways maybe. Um, I think this is sort of the premise of this conversation, which is that the datafication of the government has happened. It's happening. Um, it's our reality. And, and this conversation is really about how to shape it, um, how to shape it in the public interest. Um, and talked about the, that the public interest, designing technology for the public interest is about aiming for 100% of the population. Uh, and that often in the private sector, it's really about shaping a market and finding a, a big group of people, not everybody, but a big group of people you can sell a product to. And that's not good enough um, in the spaces we're talking about. Um, some of the solutions that, that are public interest oriented address things like accessibility, but other values. And I think um, Deirdre points out that public interest isn't about a group of individuals, it's about um, what serves society, right? So let's not kind of reduce this to counting up individuals and, and who can use a product and who can't. Um, I think we agree that the pit field, the public interest technology field isn't just about adding in computer scientists or engineers alongside the lawyers who've already been getting public interest training, mix it up and you've solved the problem. We need lots of forms of expertise, um, including social scientists, so repping the social scientists like me. Um, and uh, any further, any final thoughts, Teardra and, and Anne? Um, Anne has a postdoc that she's, she's looking for postdocs. So here's your chance, Anne, to plug the postdoc position. I forgot I needed to plug. Yes. And I forgot and didn't even have the bit.ly ready. Um, I'm hiring two postdocs to work on data justice and racial uh, equality in digital infrastructures. Um, we'll be hiring from May. Thank you, Rigo. Um, we'll be hiring. Uh, the ad will be up next week and um, applications are due early June. Any I final just, thing? Deirdre, go for it. Yeah, I would just say that um, I think that technologists and their participation in um, organizations that are promoting social justice, are promoting systemic change, your participation in those conversations is really important. While techno solutionism is not uh, often the right choice, sometimes, right, the, the, the ways in which technology can solve a problem is in fact going to be the best way to protect a right or value that we care about at a social level. And so I think the same way law, right, a filing a court case, making a legal argument isn't always the right way to solve a problem, right? Sometimes you need boots in the street. Um, and none of us have like the tool that fixes everything all the time. And the question is coming together in environments where we can think about what we bring to the table and mutually have conversations about how to yield them towards the benefit of society. Thank you so much, Professor Ann Washington, Professor Deirdre Mulligan, for such an engaging conversation. And thank you to the audience for tuning in to be part of the first in our series on conversations on the datafied state. Uh, if you would like further information about the series, go to datasociety.net. Uh, there is will also be some follow-up information about this uh, panel session, links, things like that. Um, and thank you so much. Take care, everybody.